but one of the things I'd love to start with, if I could, is just talking about in the last 10 or 15 years, what the folks in this room have been building and doing in emerging markets around the world are pretty extraordinary. I mean, I think even 10 years ago, if we were sitting here and would look at the adoption of mobile technology and what people are doing it, the caliber of entrepreneurship, I'm not sure we would have necessarily predicted it. And I'm just sort of curious, you know, what's been your overview? What have you seen that sort of surprised you in the last decade in that way? Yeah, well, the first thing that was surprising is actually how long it took um, in that, you know, I think we saw the first WAP. Do you guys remember WAP? The first WAP browser, uh, which was uh, on a phone in 1996 when we were at Netscape. Um, and, uh, and it worked, you know, like you go on the internet and do stuff, it was pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, but it kind of just lay there dormant, um, or not dormant, you know, there, there were internet connected phones the whole way, um, but it didn't really change anything uh, other than email. So you had email in your pocket. Um, and so it took a very, very long time and then it changed all of a sudden, uh, which tends to be how these things go, they, they take much longer than you would expect, and then when they happen, they happen much faster than you would think. Um, and then the other thing that's a little surprising to me is the way the breakthrough occurred. So, and it, it probably shouldn't have been, but you know, we were always thinking of it as like, eventually like bandwidth and processing power gets to like where the products get better. Um, but it was kind of the thing that made it happen very quickly was Apple took this chance where they said, look, you know, it's not a phone, and we don't have to hit a phone price point. Um, it's a computer, and like the phone is probably the least interesting application, and so we're going to take a big jump from everything that had been done, and we're gonna put an actual, like, real operating system on it, and what I mean by real is that you can develop very high quality software to it, so that unlike, you know, BlackBerry OS was, or unlike Symbian was, where you could do trivial things, but not, not really solve the hard problems, and then by doing that, um, they were able to build a user experience that was really breakthrough. Um, and, and, and up until that point, I think that most of us didn't even realize how compromised the old user experiences were. And so, and, and then of course, then once it happened, then here we are. Would you have expected that literally in some of these countries that are represented here, as much as 100% mobile penetration, just like, even before we talk smartphones, which I'll come back to in a second, but I think that took even people in the industry by utter surprise. You know, I think so because the the value proposition is so amazing. Um, you know, connectivity uh, to the world is a really big deal. And then once you get to a smartphone, I mean, for those of us who grew up with computers and uh, watched, you know, at first you needed uh, millions of dollars in a refrigerated room. Um, and to have more power than that in your pocket and then have it connected to the world so that literally the world is in your pocket, including like the entire Library of Congress and uh, every bit of music that was ever recorded and, and uh, every scientific paper and every, like that is just an amazing amount of value. Like at any other point in time that would have been worth, you know, you, somebody might have paid, you know, $500 million for it and to be able to get it for a few hundred bucks and then a monthly service charge, yeah, that'd be the first thing that I would buy if I was uh, anywhere in the world. Um, you know, it's better than a car, it's better than anything. So, so that part, to me, hasn't been surprising. Your, your partner, Mark, has, he actually wrote in my forward, but has said it repeatedly, that you know, in the next eight years, 10 years, pick your time, there'll be five billion smartphones on the planet. To your point, these are not communication devices alone, these are not entertainment devices, it's supercomputing capacity in right. the hands of two thirds of humanity within a decade. What does that look like? What do you think about when you think about that? Well, I think it, you know, I, I think it's starting to get like super exciting, and um, we kind of. The, the neat thing about uh, being in the computer industry is when, when I started uh, as a computer science student in the early '80s, and then when I went to work at Silicon Graphics, the thing that I, the first thing that you realized in those days was, computers were really, really amazing at building computers. Um, so like, and it's hard, but we used to, when we designed circuits, we'd have like colored pencils and like we'd be drawing them. Like in school, you'd, you'd have these colored pencils and you would draw the circuits out and you'd try and figure it out and do the calculations. And um, like that was like chip design that way and then chip design on a computer with like a silicon graphics machine and software from Cadence or something like that it was just night and day and you're like, wow, these computers are gonna be really important because like look how good they are at making computers. 
Um, and we've seen kind of the same thing with the internet, where if you look at the evolution of programming languages um, from, you know, again, like probably the early 80s to uh, kind of the late 90s, there, there was almost no change because, you know, they're very sticky. Um, you know, they, you need them to be highly performant and optimized and all these kinds of things. So th there wasn't really any advance until kind of the internet and open source. And then in the last 10 years, there's been more progress uh, in terms of what you get as a programmer than there were like in the whole history of computing before that. And, you know, and that's because you now have like everybody working on a programming language. So like if you're writing something in Python, the number of people who have contributed to what you're writing is just enormous. Yeah. And, you know, and I think programming languages are the first thing, but if you think about that in physics or biology or, or any field, what's possible now, where before you were working in isolation or working with maybe you know, a couple of guys in your lab to now you're working with the world, uh, that's probably the most exciting thing that's going on, and I think that um, despite uh, what, what some people think and have written, I think we're probably on the verge of the kind of biggest set of scientific breakthroughs uh, that the world has ever seen. And it's all because we have five billion people. Now, like all the, all the creative smart people in the world can play, as opposed to the, you know, the people at MIT or the people at Stanford or, or these uh, like super elite environments. We, we are talking about then a revolution about parts of the world that, that maybe have not been acknowledged before. Your brothers and sisters in Silicon Valley, some of them over the last 15, 20 years, have gone so far as to open offices in different corners of the world. Yep. Others try to do it by a plane. But there's a sort of feeling that something's happening out there. How has it been going, do you think? And how do you think it could be going thereafter? Well, so, um, the, and there's two different things. There's like, OK, are great things being invented worldwide, and then are there like super valuable companies being built worldwide. And I think on the former, it's gone exceptionally well. So, um, and not just so there's venture capitalists who have gone and invested in other countries and you know, in, in the developing world. And then there's big companies that have um, you know, built development offices there. And the latter has worked exceptionally well. Um, and great software is being built all over the world. Uh, and you know, just like the breakthroughs in Eastern Europe have been stunning and, and amazing. Um, and that's happened at an incredibly fast rate. On the other hand, in terms of really big companies, there have been software products we were talking backstage about. You know, Estonia built Skype, and that was quite amazing. And Israel certainly produced um, a few uh, very significant companies. But by and large, if you look at the smart people outside of kind of the US and then outside of Silicon Valley, and what's been produced from a like venture capital return standpoint, and then what's happened in Silicon Valley, it's still extremely lopsided. So if you look at, OK, in the last decade, what are the companies that have been created that are worth more than $10 billion? And you go through the list as well, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, you know, Workday, depending on what day, uh, Tesla, um, probably Twitter, uh, you know, depending on what it is. And then, like, those are all, like, in a 100-mile radius of each other. And then, like, what are the ones that were created outside of that 100-mile radius? And it's kind of hard to think of them. Uh, so that part hasn't, uh, I would say, gone as well or worked as well. When you're a venture capitalist, particularly one of your capacity and caliber, that criteria seems to be quite wonderful and important from an investment theory perspective. Yes. It's a big world out there. And there are lots of ways to make money and lots of very interesting, innovative people. Mm -hmm. is, is that the criteria by which to judge, one, economic opportunity, and secondly, ecosystem building? Well, I think that, um, and I'm speaking as a Silicon Valley venture capitalist. Uh, so for our business, right, like that's, all the returns, the way, the way venture capital works, it's an extreme parallel curve. And like all the returns, like the bulk of the returns are in those companies. Um, so if you look at, you know, in any given year, the top 15 companies will return 90% of the market cap for that class of companies. Um, and, you know, of the thousands started. And so, like, those are the ones that you have to be in if you're kind of a serious about venture capital. Now, that's not to say that there's no return anywhere else. 
And it's also, um, you know, when you're talking about those companies, you're talking about like the global winners. So who's going to build like the social network with a billion people on it is a different question than, you know, things that are valuable to society. My wife does a lot of work in um, India and, you know, one of the laws in India that there, there's a law and I trying to remember exactly how it works, but basically there's like a, a right to work so that if, if you don't have a job, like there'll be funding for you to work for a few months um, and, and get paid at like some job doing something to help the infrastructure of the country. Um, but like people getting access just to do the paperwork to do those jobs is like a huge problem. And so a kid from MIT went back to India and built uh, a system so that like people could get to their right to work. Uh, and like that's an amazingly valuable thing to create. It's probably not a venture capital project, um, but there's a lot of things that are happening on that scale. And then I think there's also, you know, these are big countries, Alibaba in China, like they're gonna go public. People think they're gonna be worth $100 billion. So, and they don't really play outside of China. Um, but you know, if you, if you are in a country with uh, more than a billion and a half people uh, and you win that country, like that's awfully significant. Um, and I think that there are a lot of opportunities like that that won't necessarily um, be the same as something like that you might find. Do you see Silicon Valley? So Linda has this wonderful term, E to E, emerging market to emerging market. And generally what she's saying is that a lot of the people in this room, when they become successful, are investing in the next generation, both within their countries and within the regions. And then you've got things like what you just described in Tencent and other stuff in China, Baidu, where right. people within ecosystems, because they're so large, are building it. So does this mean Silicon Valley just says, well, go ahead, you guys do that, we're not gonna play? Or how do you think about those opportunities that are being built from an investor perspective and particularly a Silicon Valley perspective? Yeah, you know, if, if there are um, kind of really important market opportunities in emerging markets, I think it's pretty unlikely that uh, Silicon Valley company is going to be the one to, to find them. Or, or like that, that is a real playing field leveler in the sense that, um, you know, when we see companies like a, a huge, huge criteria for us investing is like, does the, entrepreneur, does the entrepreneur know something that nobody else knows? Like, do they have some secret that makes what, you know, their idea much better than you might think? Um, and that's what leads to the really big outcomes. A good example of this is uh, my friend Drew Houston built this company, Dropbox. And at the time, uh, when he was originally raising money, there were like 30 guys who were doing the same thing. It's, oh yeah, storage in the cloud. It's a very obvious idea. Um, but the thing that he knew from, you know, one going to MIT and being a brilliant computer scientist and like messing around with it is to kind of, like it was a very hard technical problem and getting all the synchronization right, the user interface right, and the cross-platform right, and all those things um, was an incredible challenge. And so by knowing what nobody else knew and tackling that problem in the right way, he ended up building a really important company. I think the same thing is applicable to if you're an emerging market entrepreneur and you see a market uh, that you understand better than anybody else or you understand the problem better than anybody else or how people are going to actually buy or use or, or get value out of the solution, um, then that's going to be an opportunity that you're advantaged in and, and that's a big deal. Um, but like going after, you know, going after uh, a market that like people in Silicon Valley are going after and understand and have like a hundred times as much money as you and access to like all the best engineers in the world, like that's a more difficult proposition. So it's interesting because I've talked to, again, your sisters and brothers in, in a lot of this, mm -hmm. and some of whom you know, have open offices yeah. all over the world. I think some of them say that they've gone better than some of them have gone. A few of them have put a couple of decent <laughs> yeah, pelts yeah, on the wall yeah, sure. and that kind of stuff. But what is so interesting to me is that when I pull on the string of this question, they'll say almost to a person the same thing over and over again. One, we got to go where market cap is going to be big. So we may lose our yeah. ass in China for a decade, but we got to be in China. And or two, um, if we can outsource something cheaply, then we're really interested in that kind of stuff. And I say, okay, that's fine. And maybe that's what got you wherever you are, or you think you are now. Yeah. But is that really the way to think about the opportunity of these markets in the next 10 or 15 years versus the way they've been thinking about it in the previous 15? Well, I, I think they, they end up being different venture capital firms that, that uh, succeed in those regions. I, I just think it's a different thing, right? Like if you're a Silicon Valley venture capital firm, 
like you know, starting from the amount, the size of your fund, to the uh, kind of kinds of people that you hire, to what you know, um, you have a return profile that, and a kind of type of company that you're looking for that's extremely specific, and that's a different kind of company than you're going to find in other places. I mean, and like I think a lot of the guys who went into China found that out, even though China yeah. kind of looks similar. Um, turns out their kind of version of things is different, like you know the way the law works and all these kinds of things, which like matter. Um, there's no concept of Guanji in the uh, in, in the U.S. <laughs> and like you have to have a lot of that to succeed in business in China. Um, so like these things matter, and you know differences matter, and, and you have to understand them. You have to be an expert in them. You have to be best in the world at that. And so I think it's different venture capitalists would be my my uh, prediction. So the, we'll you, definitely continue to have You and Mark have said repeatedly the first l rule of uh, Andreessen Horowitz is there are no rules. You started off and still remain highly, highly focused Silicon Valley, but now you've invested around the country for sure. What kinds of things could happen to make you say, we're going to have to think about the world differently as investors? Well, look, we're always, if somebody becomes an exception, <laughs> um, you know, we're invested in Jumio, which is located in Austria, and we're invested in Capriza which is engineering is based in Israel, and we, you know, we invested in Skype, of course, which had engineering in Estonia. Um, like, if somebody goes and builds like the winning product and is starting to build the winning company and is like dominating, or, or like looks like they're, they, you know, they're just way ahead of the competition, like we'll invest in that in a second. Um, if we're looking for the next company from nothing, you know. And you could say, okay, look, we could have more market share in Silicon Valley, or we could go try and find elsewhere in the world um, where like, we can do that. That's a little harder for us, because the, the other thing that we try to do is be respectful of what we don't know. Um, and we understand like Silicon Valley culture extremely well. It is not the same culture. Like, <laughs> the Skype guys in Estonia did not think about the world uh, in the same way. Um, you know, Just for example, like stock options were far less important to them, and they were more skeptical of them. Uh, you know, and part, and a lot of it is from the country history, like you know, what can you trust? And talking to the guys at Index, Danny Reimer and Mike Volpe, they're like, well, you know, we invest in beer drinking countries, but not wine drinking countries. <laughs> and like, like these are the things you have to know to succeed globally. And like, we know enough to know that we don't know those things. Um, so we we stick to our knitting a bit, unless you know, like somebody emerges, and then. And then, of course, we would definitely fund it. Uh, but for the brand new idea, for those kinds of things, I think we're pretty far away from doing if that. This is why I'm too much of a generalist, because I'm happy to invest in both beer and wine. I, yeah. I'm totally agnostic. <laughs> yes. Look, we so the, you've talked and written beautifully about and very provocatively about ecosystem and the network effect of talent, which has very much been about Silicon Valley. Right. It, it, there is something that's going on, and I wonder what you're reacting about it, which is that a lot of the classic, first of all, I'd love just you to, you to give a quick overview of what you think is the most important thing in an ecosystem. And secondly, thinking again the, about the future 10 years in technology as opposed to where we've been today, are there changes where that despite the ecosystem, where in some of the, some countries that you're not gonna get the education system put up to a standard that you may look for in an ideal Silicon Valley way in the next 10 or 15 years, but now people are doing so many interesting things, educating themselves, using technology, you know, in, in, in a very interesting open source kind of way. Is, can you do this despite the ecosystem, or do you think that the ecosystem will look different as you think about it in the next 10 years? Well, it's really depending on, like, do what, <laughs> um, I, I think is the big thing, like, do what. Uh, and so, look, there's no question that, like, right now, today, there are, like, very, very smart people who are amazing programmers outside of Silicon Valley. Um, and that you know that that continues, but look, we should talk a little bit about what the network effect means because like there's great you know actors and actresses outside of Hollywood. Um, there's great you know like filmmakers and so forth, but yet like all the big movies tend to get made in Hollywood, um, and all the kind of big tech companies tend to get made in Silicon Valley. And why is that? And it's a lot easier to actually make a movie than make a tech company, I should point out. Um, and so like where do, you know what is it about this network effect and where does it come from? And, and, and what does it mean? And so it, it really comes down to like, if you are a great, if you have a great idea, um, and then you are a great entrepreneur, and great, by great entrepreneur, a lot of what being a great entrepreneur is about, and 
I've written about is like, like you have to build a company. Like it's, it's not a choice. Um, it's not like you wake up and say, oh, should I build a company or should I uh, become a cook? Like it's no, like you have to build a company and, and it has to be an important company. And if today in the world, you know, you wake up and that's how you're feeling and you look at the world and you go, oh, look, you know, Andy Bechtelsheim and Peter Thiel and Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey and Drew Houston all like live within like a very short distance of each other. Should I go there um, where like clearly all the best engineers are like the, the, the concentration of, of great talent is or should I like stay home? And so if you're the entrepreneur who says I have to go there, you're probably the one that, uh, that I want to invest in. You're probably the one that's going to win because you're the one who cares about nothing else in life other than building that company. Um, and like maybe that's not a good way to be philosophically, but like that's what it takes to, to win. Um, you know, and just like the fact that like Mark Zuckerberg dropped out of Harvard and moved to Silicon Valley. Like, you know, like he didn't stay in Boston, he moved to Silicon Valley, like that's interesting. And then, so then once all those people are there, what happens is the expectation and the ambition um, of companies in the region is just higher than anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. But the level of expectation and ambition and like what you do in terms of building the world beating company um, is just higher in Silicon Valley than anywhere else. So that's kind of the network effect and the ecosystem that you're talking about. And kind of replicating that somewhere else is a huge challenge because um, like the next great entrepreneur, the next great engineer is just so much more likely to go to Silicon Valley than anywhere else. Um, so if you're trying to build a company like that, that is hard to do outside. It's been done, but like not at anywhere near the rate. Um, but if you're trying to solve like a very important problem in a specific country or set of countries that people aren't addressing or these kinds of things, um, you know, that's a more viable, you have more time, um, you have more knowledge. Uh, th these things are different, but I, I do think they end up being different investors and, and different entrepreneurs. But again, if we were to look more towards the next 10 years, and, and I, you know, as obvious, you see three kinds of folks when I have this conversation when I'm out around the world, and, and there are folks that would sell their left leg to get to Silicon Valley if they can, and you've, you are backing some of them, remarkable people that I know. Mm -hmm. There are people that love to visit, like to spend time there, but are hoping to leverage something and bring it back, maybe a business development, what have you. But I think progressively, and I think some statistics are beginning to back this out, because there's so much broader societal change that's going on in many ways, is folks want to stay home. And it's not just because they don't care about their business, they don't want it in their teeth, yeah. they don't want to win, because I gotta tell you, you're sitting in a room now of some of the most tenacious winners I've ever met anywhere at any time. Yeah. But there are lots of reasons to want to be home, some of which is I want to build an ecosystem there. Maybe, let, let's concede, it may or may not be what Silicon Valley is today, but it could be very important and it could be very successful and these are large markets and I can make a lot of money, but I also could help build a great country. I mean, there are lots of other things mm -hmm. that are going on. And so, I, again, I want to push about in the next 10 years, is there a dynamic that's, chasing, that's important that, that we can all concede that Silicon Valley will remain what it is? But is there something else that's going to be happening in multiple locations that should be thought about differently? And by the way, facilitated by access to technology. Yeah, look, I hope so. I mean, you know, I hope that uh, the world would be a much better place if there were 10 or 100 Silicon Valleys. Um, like, that would be better um, than it all being like in one area. Um, it would be a lot less like traffic and housing it might not be so expensive too, and there'd be other good things about it. Um, and like maybe it breaks down over time or maybe, you know, uh, you know I may gave the Hollywood example before. Bollywood is actually with the changes in the uh, economics of movies. Like it turns out people like to watch movies in India a lot more than they do in the U.S. now. Um, and so Bollywood is kind of getting pretty serious as a, as a place to make them. Um, but, you know, you know look, look, a lot of us would like to stay home. I'd like to stay home, but, but, but a big distinguishing thing between the people who build, like, you know, Thomas Edison or Henry Ford or, um, you know, or, or, or Dave Packard or Mark Zuckerberg is that the company is the thing. Like, more than anything else is the thing. And those are the guys who, who seem to build the biggest companies. Um, those are the people who build the biggest companies. So. You know, I, I'm not convinced that that all of the sun uh, changes, and um, and so I think that it it will still. I mean, like it, it's not changed yet. 
um, I would have expe expected that there would be someplace else with at least five or 10 important companies uh, that got built out of that region. I mean, like really important, long-lasting uh, companies. Not, I mean, we built a lot of not important companies in Silicon Valley today. Um, but like it hasn't happened yet. So to predict it's going to happen um, is a little tricky in that I don't know what makes it happen. Uh, but look, there are people are going to be doing really interesting things around the world, and those are going to um, both like help uh, the economy in the local area. I mean, India is like a completely different place. Just on like, if you just took the the Indian engineers working for U.S.-based companies, like that's been transformational. And then once you have that, um, then you start to get the knowledge to build your own companies. And like, and I think that'll be transformational at least first uh, locally, and then maybe it becomes transformational globally. But that's a little like whether that's in five years or ten years or when that happens or whether, you know, like Silicon Valley's got a decline like the Roman Empire first. I don't know, but. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> Apparently, according to my friend George Packer, that's maybe coming soon. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I, I sometimes don't, never understand why the rise of other, I mean, this is a true in politics as it is in business, why the rise of something must mean by definition the decline of something else, particularly with the dynamics that are changing so much. So that part of it I never quite understood. Well, you, you know, and, and, and this kind of gets to, uh, There aren't like a lot of cases of, of, of very local technology companies. It tends to be like if you build a technology company, it competes globally, and so in that way, you do have to you, you have to get to world class. And you know, if there are very big markets and um, and you're competing with the best companies in the world, like right now, that means at least to some degree, you have to be as good as a Silicon Valley company. Now, there are a lot of cases where there, there wasn't a good Silicon Valley company or like something else happened or, you know, you have Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos and like you build a giant company in Seattle and, and those have been like pretty spectacular. So it, it's not like a hard and fast rule or anything, but, um, you know, building a place that repeatably produces large companies, which is part of the question you're asking me, um, you, you know, that's harder, like that's harder to see like when that happens or how that happens or, or what happens. We would not have necessarily predicted that consumer electronics and mobile capacity would have been blown out in places like Japan or Korea or Finland. Yeah. Uh, now Finland's got its own, Nokia's got its own problems, but notwithstanding that it rose as it did, sure. I don't think I would have called 20 years ago and all. And, and Seattle's an interesting thing. It's interesting yeah. that some very powerful e-commerce companies are in fact not from the valley, but different parts yeah. of the United States. I mean, Tony's in Las Vegas doing great and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And so yeah. is there something inherently different about software versus kind of hardware, consumer electronics, and e-commerce? And is there any ideas of, again, how software might be the answer to your question of, I don't know what triggers it, but in fact, is it the fact that the connectedness associated with software and the ability to do so much at scale and with a few amount of people may in fact be that thing that makes other parts of the world pop the way those did? Yeah, I, I don't know that it's inherently different. I mean, Silicon Valley is very good at software. Um, and then the more things become software, like all of a sudden Silicon Valley is good at consumer electronics because they're software-based. My friend uh, Hossein is here. And like the fact that he could build that company already to such scale um, is a just it's awesome. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's, a, it's because software has become part of the solution. Um, like you couldn't build that company if you couldn't easily compete with Korea uh, otherwise. Um, but like I do think it is already. Ha I mean, if you look at China, the big technology. I mean, you know, Huawei, ZTE, Tencent, Alibaba. Like Baidu. these are pretty big and significant companies. Baidu. I mean, and they, they they're more contained uh, in China um, than than the U.S. companies have been. But like it's clearly possible. Uh, and I think that the advantage um, that they've had is you know, selling in country, it's a very big country that's growing very fast. And so particularly in markets where, you know, your market and your country is changing extremely rapidly, um, that it's hard to imagine like that a U.S. company figures that out and, and then decodes it and is able to, you know, figure out all the laws and the government structure and the consumer behavior and all that better than, than you could there. So I think those, those opportunities are real and well. Well, yeah.
Look, we run, we could, I could keep you for two hours, Ben. It's unbelievable to spend some time with you, but we've run out of time. I'm just wondering, you've got this incredible group of entrepreneurs here across spectrums, both technology and not technology, who really are building ecosystems to whatever degree uh, within their countries and their regions. Is there some one sort of unobvious thing from your experience of being with so many entrepreneurs that's not rah-rah, but really sort of insightful you'd like to leave them with? <laughs> I don't have any insights. It's, it's just hard. <laughs> it's my, my, look, I... <clears throat> John Reed, who's like an old crusty guy who used to run Citigroup, uh, told me when I was starting my company, he says, he goes, Ben, you know, and he ran Citigroup, so he was like very like uh, thoughtful about like economic opportunities and things like that, and he goes, Ben, the only reason to start a company is because you have an irrational desire to do so, because it's not worth the money. Um, and nothing truer had ever been said to me because you know, we built, uh, you know, that company that I was working on at the time, Opsware ended up selling, you know, I guess eight years later to Hewlett Packard for $1.6 billion, and I can tell you it was not worth the money. So um, <laughs> hopefully you all have an irrational desire to build a company because that's the only reason to do it. It's great to spend time with you, man. Thank, Thank you. you.